Or you, can we start? Is that Rock okay? And roll. Whenever you want, you just give me the sh- finger and let me start timing. There we go. Great. Good morning, good morning, friends of CETL uh, podcast series here at SUU of Teaching and Learning at Southern Utah University. Tony Pellegrini here uh, with our uh, monthly um, honoree uh, today. We have Josh Price, who's an associate professor in economics here at Southern Utah University. He won uh, the Thunderbird Award last year for Professor of the Year, and we want to we want to uh, know a little bit more about um, him and his teaching and and his learning here at SUU as well. So. Josh, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Absolute pleasure. It's great to be with you. Would you take a moment or two, give our listeners just a little bit of background uh, about yourself and your activities here at SUU? Yeah, so I originally grew up on the west side of Portland uh, in Oregon and had a wonderful experience there and uh, thinking of uh, pursuing education. So I did some uh, community college, Utah State, BYU, ended up going to graduate school out in New York. Uh, First job was in Texas and absolutely loved Texas. Um, you know, became a, a, a true Texas fan, if you will, had not been before. And about seven years ago, we just had the opportunity to come here to Cedar City, and, and we were very excited for it. We, we love the outdoors, and this was a wonderful place to be. So I've been here at SU for a little over seven years now, uh, teaching in the economics department. Exciting. It's, it's a fun place to be, absolutely fun place to be. We've got a couple of questions for you, if you uh, would be willing to work with us today. Uh, we really would be uh, interested in understanding your teaching philosophy, you know, how that developed, how you're putting that into practice, how you uh, tweaked and adjusted that through Texas or through your activities back, in, back east. Yeah, so uh, for my teaching philosophy is really to try to be an effective teacher. And to do so, I really put that into three different categories or three different things that I can do to be an effective teacher. Uh, And the first is course design. How do I design my course in a way that is going to facilitate learning of the students and retention and uh, learning of the material? Uh, The second has to do with delivery. How do I deliver the course? How do I engage students in the 50 minutes that I get them three times a week? What can I do to really get them to be an active participant in the learning process? And, And the third one is the dedication to the students is... As a teacher, to be really effective, you need to be dedicated to the students, and you need to do a lot for them and show the concern for them and be dedicated to helping them achieve their own goals. And so when I think of uh, my teaching philosophy, it's design, delivery, and dedication. That, that design really intrigues me. Um, uh, uh, you know, do you, you start, of course, from your own perspective, how you see and you um, observe things in your classroom. Do you, uh, what feedback do you receive from students or, or, or encourage students to help you in that design over time uh, with a class? So I think students are always willing to give you their opinions on the design of the course. Um, and, and so I, and I absolutely 100% appreciate that and, and encourage that. Um, in the midway through each semester and after every exam, I always ask students to ask for feedback. What are things that I can do personally? But more importantly, what are things that can change with the design of the class? And so one thing that I, I used to have deadlines at 10 p.m. To me, that's like a, it's a good number. Um, you know, an arbitrary number, absolutely. And the feedback from students is, why can't it be due at midnight? And I had no particular reason, and so it's uh, done. Like, it's due Friday at 10, now it's due Friday at midnight. It made that change mid-semester. So as we think about the design of a course is, how do we engage students regularly in the course material? And are there preferences that they have that we can meet that still achieve that objective? And there's one book that I I absolutely encourage everyone to read is Make It Stick. Um, And I I love this book. It talks about how learning occurs and long-term learning. Uh, and a lot of it talks about repeated engagement with the material. And that learning is a two-step process. One is bringing information into your mind, and the second is being able to recall that information. Uh, and so think about designing a course that gets students to do both of these things, a- exposure to the material, and then repeated uh, recalling of that information. And, s- and so in the book, they talk a lot about these low-stake tests. That testing is incredibly important, but oftentimes making them very low stakes so that there's not that pressure to build up and that's what they really encourage for learning is a lot of repeated low-stake tests. And, and, and in education, I think we do call those formative assessments. You're uh, inter, in, you know, uh, inter- incrementally throughout the class, you're receiving, oh, how am I doing on this? How are my learners doing? Well, they're not catching this. I've got to go back and, and really make some adjustments on that. I, you, you really connected with me uh, when you mentioned, you know, hey, 10 o'clock is a good time to close. Uh, and I appreciate your feet, your learners saying, oh, could you give us till midnight? I was thinking to myself, oh, my gosh, that's when students just start, <laughs> uh, you know, cl- uh, getting work on their homework or assignments. Uh, with my learners, they said, Tony, you don't get up till 6 the next morning. Why don't you give us till 6 the next morning uh, to get those in? And 
I said, yeah, I'm not going to get up at two or three or four in the morning to score these. If you need a couple more hours, you take them. And so I think that's a wonderful approach to listen to your students. And with that, what's really interesting is also think of the technologies we have. So we, ha we use Canvas here at SUU. And on Canvas, a lot of students use the calendar feature. And so what I have found, actually, if I have things due in the morning, they see it's, oh, it's due on Monday. And so they think I get all day Monday to do it. And so I found, like, anything that's due in the morning, that students oftentimes think they get the whole day. And so they actually miss deadlines a lot. So that's really is be attentive to your students and think about the technology you have and how it is displayed for students that might influence their behavior. Well, uh, to, uh, uh, I do want to just stay, stay with this uh, kind of uh, delivery that you mentioned as well, too. Talk to us about this last year. What uh, you know, with COVID and all the things that have gone on, has that how has that impacted your delivery? Uh, it, it's been horrible. <laughs> uh, I mean, in, in all honesty, like it's been horrible. And this is uh, one thing that I've learned a lot is there's a lot of tools that online delivery provides. There's a lot of tools that face-to-face -face delivery provides. There's tools that uh, f uh, online synchronous provides versus asynchronous. What I have found is to try to combine any of those aspects leads to student failure. I And part of that is I don't have the ability and the bandwidth to be able to design tools and activities in the classroom uh, for the students that are there and as well as activities online. So one example is I love pair and share. I do love to say, hey, here's an, an example real quick. Talk to the person next to you, share with them, and, and just talk, what does this mean to you? And so to do that in the classroom is really quick. I can do that seven or eight times in a 50-minute classroom because it takes about one or two minutes. To do that in an online setting, in a synchronous online setting, it requires breakout rooms which takes about 60 seconds for students to accept the invitation sometimes. You give them, and then about 60 seconds for them to come back. And so you can only do that two or three times max in a 50-minute class period for an, an online synchronous. And so that's really where um, one lesson I learned is I can't do both. And so this year, as I'm really trying to dedicate, I have an online asynchronous course. I'm trying to use the tools to make that successful. I have a face-to-face -face course, and I'm using the tools for that. Now I'm trying to be accommodating for students that are impacted by COVID, and so if they have to be online, I view that that's a temporary. I'm not going to design tools for that. You're just kind of an observer in the class. Uh, and that's something I think has been a little more successful for me is that I'm saying this is a face-to-face -face class. I'm going to use the tools for that because I don't know the tools to do that mix and match within a given class period. Well, uh, I think what I hear you saying is uh, as an instructor, as a professor, please look at the tools that we do have, look at your learners, look at the modalities that, you know, are available us to teach and and uh, don't try to uh, sample the whole Rio salad bar. Uh, focus on where you're really the most effective. And, and that is part of it, like with instruction and as a teacher as well is what are you best at? And to really focus on that is um, I was department chair for a while and I have some teachers that are really best at face to face classes. And they are just dynamic personalities or very undynamic personalities and students like that. Um, but they have their special talents. And really think about what your talent is and build around that. And that's what I'd say is really rather than try to do something you're not good at, focus on what you're good at and talk to, I mean, if you're a faculty member, talk to your department chair and say, hey, I'm really good at this. Can I do more of this? Yep. That's wonderful. Let's let's change attack just a little bit here. Um, uh, our podcast is about teaching and learning here at Southern Utah University. Uh, is there anything you haven't figured out yet about teaching and learning? Oh, here there's a lot. Like I, I, um, I am, as I always say, I'm the eighth best economics professor here at <laughs> SUU, uh, which does put me in the top ten. So I'm really excited about that. There are eight professors, um, but there's a lot that I haven't figured out. And so, like this last year, I, I took a lot of exerted effort. I wanted to ask colleagues and friends that I know in academia. What can I do to get better? Um, and, or, and as well as not just what I can do, but rather what did they do that makes them good? Uh, and so there's two examples that really I, that I found lack, myself lacking uh, and wanting to, to do better. So I actually, for the first time ever, I had an outside observer come to see my class. It was takes a, a little bit of intestinal fortitude for Well, but that, it wasn't someone it? from SU. It was just a visitor from another oh. university that was here for a research. And I said, Wonderful. why don't you come to my class? So cool. he sat in the back. Uh, he listened to my 50-minute lecture. Uh, it was, you know, I thought it went wonderful. And he's like, your slides are really bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, no, no, they're they're fantastic. Did you not see how I bolded those words? It's like, they're just too many too many words. I noticed that when you started, when you put up a new slide and you started talking, they stopped looking at you and started reading the slide. A and so to me, it took that little bit of humility to realize maybe my slides aren't as good as I think they are. Uh, and so I reached out to, I have a friend who works as a director of teaching and learning at Canvas. Uh, he was actually the Canvas instructor of the year. His folks live here in Cedar to give him a connection, Sean Newfer. Um, but he put together videos of how to design slides. And his, one of the focuses, or the message that I took from that is fewer words, more pictures. And then let me be the one that's instructing you and guiding you along that path. Uh, and for me as a teacher, that's hard because sometimes I don't remember 
the story, or sometimes I don't remember where I'm supposed to go. So I put this, a lot of words on the slide to help me as much as it is to help the students. And so his suggestion is have slides on your screen that you're looking at, and then a slide for the students for them to look at so that you don't get lost um, and students can engage in your lecture. Uh, and the second with that is I was talking to Dave Lunt, history professor here at SU, and I just have a, a tons of respect for, for Dave. Uh, both in, our, I think, one of our first years here, he beat me in the great raft debate. Uh, Well-deserved victory for him. But I asked him, what, what makes you a good teacher? And he said, I'm really good at storytelling. Uh, and, and talking with Dave, he is. He, he can tell you a story, and it, you just, you're engaged so much with that story as you want to know how it ends. And so what I learned from Dave is I need to be a better storyteller to both engage the student and to use stories as a way to teach principles. Economics can be boring. Not every student really loves, hey, let's get into the math of this. Uh, but if I can tell a story of why it is that supply and demand changes prices, now the student gets engaged, and that's something I'm not very good at, is I'm not a very good storyteller. And so I've, I've tried to, as I listen to others give talks or give speeches, uh, I look, what's the stories that they're telling, and how can I incorporate that? And that's something I learned from Dave Lunt that is, for me, something that I lack in doing is telling interesting stories to engage students um, and to capture their interest and to teach important principles. I think that's profound. I th you know, that, that, that uh, auditory storytelling, the, the visual writing, the uh, uh, the visualization of the pictures. I think that you know having a picture on there absolutely says a thousand words, but gives the students some context to be able to put that in. I, I think the the support of those three is just so powerful. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, uh, another question I have for you is: as you review your instruction, your prior instruction with your learners, like you said, you have them three days a week um, in previous uh, courses. How do you prepare your learners for what's coming up next in your class? You know where you want to go. How do you make that? How do you communicate that or keep your learners engaged in that? Well, I think that kind of goes back to the d design of the course. And so for me is from day one, my course is fully on Canvas. They know what we're going to do every class period uh, in terms of topics, not necessarily details. I might have some lecture slides posted. I might have uh, ass assignments are always posted. Discussions are always posted. So from the day one, they know exactly where we're going. And so part of that is to, you know, if you're a good storyteller, sometimes you don't tell the ending, right? You live that cliffhanger. At the end of a chapter, you stop and you're like, you want to read that next chapter. So I think part of this is, and I'm not there yet, but... As we get to the end of a class period, let's let them know wh why. What's next? Why are we doing this? Uh, why? What? What are we doing today? And how is it going to connect to the bigger picture? Um, and the other is, and I remember one of my teachers uh, was taking econometrics from Mike Ransom, and it's a course that I teach now. And I just remember being lost, <laughs> completely lost. And then just one day, he stopped. He said, "Let's just look at the forest. What is it we're trying to do?" And he he described the forest of econometrics. What's the big picture that we're trying to do? And in that moment, it was a clairvoyant moment where all of a sudden I realized, oh, I see what I'm doing. I see why we're focusing on these individual trees. And, and for me, that was just like this amazing moment of learning. Uh, and so that's something that I think I, c I can do better at. But I think a good teacher is really good at saying, here's the forest, but we need to focus on the trees. And we need to focus on the details and these little assumptions and these different uh, um, variations of it. But to keep the big picture in mind. Thank you so much. You really can. I, I really connected with what you mentioned about storytelling and the, you know, the story kind of continues. A uh, hundred years ago, a radio announcer, uh, Paul Harvey, would always and now have you know the rest of the story. There you go. You absolutely. even got the voice. <laughs> uh, I mean, it absolutely fascinated me. It was at lunchtime. Uh, we were able to have lunch out on the farm, and, and I want to know the rest of the story. <laughs> Uh, and and it may be ongoing, you know. It may it, it, it may be something that you know we have to continue with. But uh, I think as humans, we want to know what happened next. They lived happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> well, what does that mean? And, and with so storytelling, I mean, I don't think like you have to tell a twenty-minute novel, if you will. A, a storytelling can be as short as twenty two minutes. You know, something that just engages and tells something very interesting. Uh, as I teach a U.S. economic history course, I mean, this is where storytelling is incredibly important. And we talk about the founding fathers, and this is where Lin-Manuel Miranda with, uh, with Alexander Hamilton, I think the story he tells is so fascinating. You know, you can read Ron Chernow's book, and you get the same story, and Ron Chernow's a great author and does a great job describing that, but when, when it's put to words, when it's put to the way that Lin-Manuel Miranda can, can really bring things alive, it really brings that beef that Alexander Hamilton had with the other founding fathers to light. It talks about the assumption plan, and and it really teaches us a lot. So I, I use that a lot in my course. I wish I could like cite it more often in, in, in textbooks and such, but with copyrights. But but I tell students like like listen to that musical because you're gonna learn some really important things and it's gonna bring these characters to life. 
like no other one can. And so, I mean, I guess I would just encourage other uh, s- songwriters out there, please, let's, let's go through all my courses and see what we can do to add music to it, to tell these stories in a very lively way. And I would encourage those dancers to bring that too. And maybe that would be uh, helpful as well too, that physical part. That would be, that would be interesting, dancing for economics. Uh, just another question for you. Uh, activities that you've sponsored at SUU. It seems you're very student-oriented. That's wonderful. Uh, How do you get your students involved with activities beyond the classroom? And this is where I think I turn back to my undergraduate experience. So I went to a school of 30,000 students. Huge. But in my economics degree, my senior year, there were only seven of us in these courses that were designed to prepare students for graduate school. And so I had a very personalized experience in the classroom but I was also working as a research assistant for one of my professors, Eric Eide, um, whose son actually played football here uh, at SU, Andrew Eide. Um, but that was the, the experience I had to get involved in research. And so for me, that's, the, that's one of the reasons I wanted to come to SUU is I want to be part of a campus community where I can work with students outside of the classroom. And so there's two groups that I'm incredibly proud of that, that have, helped, have started here at SU. Uh, the first is the Investment Scholars Group. Uh, Grant Smith, one of our alumni, reached out to me and said, hey, Josh, I, I had a wonderful experience at SU. I think we can do more to help prepare students for the investment field. I said, absolutely, let's do it. And so we, we got 12 advisors together, alumni and others that work in the investment field, both the financial analyst and the financial planning uh, and wealth advising. And then we got students involved. So now students are connected with these advisors. Uh, we, got, we started participating in competitions across the country. Uh, we had $50,000 from DA Davidson to invest here on campus. We were able to, to work on that in the uh, Steve Harrop Investment Lab in the business building. And so that was a wonderful experience to really connect this extracurricular activity where you're able to take the things you've learned in the classroom, but you're able to connect with alumni. And I think that's incredibly important when we think about uh, getting students involved on campus is let's connect them not just to people here on campus, but to the network that SU provides. What a wonderful uh, idea as well, because then uh, it's an easy follow-up a year or two or three from now when they're alumni and when they're succeeding, hey, it's time to give back. And what I found is like when people want to give to an institution, it's the donations, uh, donations with lots of zeros, they, they want to do so because they're con- they feel connected. And what I found is when some of these do- uh, advisors got connected, then asking for donations was actually really easy. And so as we think about a university is if we can find ways to get alumni involved with student organizations, I think we'll find that donations are going to come in a lot quicker and with a lot more zeros behind it because they, they see what the impact it can have on these students. And so that's why I've actually loved being a part of the Investment Scholars Group. What wonderful connections. Josh, uh, those are really the questions that I wanted to pose in front of you today. Uh, Can you take just a moment maybe and uh, give our listeners any last minute words of advice, whether they're teachers or maybe even as students, uh, students who may be listening to this saying, you know, what can I do to be a better learner at uh, SUU? So I think one of the, the challenges, uh, I students or people ask me a lot, like, what's it like teaching SUU students? Um, and, and I try to answer this as politically as possible. But I think what, like, the true answer I have is we have very gifted students that have never set their sights high. They've, they might be from rural Utah. They might be from other places where they've never been challenged to set their sights higher. And what I have found is as, as instructors, if we challenge our students, if we set their sights higher, that they see what they can accomplish. They see what they can do, and they'll rise to the occasion. And so I think we have incredibly gifted students uh, that may not have had an opportunity to be pushed before. And so we really do need to push them. And in the classroom, that's hard, but in extracurricular activities, that's really, I think, where it's at. And so as professors, think about what you can do, not just in the classroom, but to really get involved in the campus environment. Uh, Another group I'm really excited about is the Health Education Action Lab. This is a student research lab here on campus. We've gone to outside funding, uh, talk space, Operation Underground Railroad, to donate money to help fund this. So students are paid to participate in this lab Uh, And they get to do research, either research with faculty or their own research. And it's incredibly challenging uh, to to go through that research process as a student uh, in your extra time. Uh, When I say extra time, I probably should do air quotes because they don't have a lot of that extra time. But what I have found, especially in this group, is as we've challenged students, they really rise to the occasion. Uh, For my first time in seven years, we had a student apply to a Ph.D. program and get full funding, uh, tuition, assistantship, health insurance. uh, And as as past his first year, Calvin Mudrow, who's at West Virginia University, uh, was a fantastic individual who got involved as an undergrad, as a, t- a teaching assistant, research assistant, and that's been able to help him achieve some of his long-term goals. And so that's really, I'd say, is give these opportunities to the students so that they can lift their sights higher and know what they can accomplish. And through that accomplishment, again, uh, as we mentioned in your earlier question, we're able to give, they're able to give back. They, they, they see that as an, a viable option. 
Thank you so much, Josh, for coming in, taking a few minutes with us this morning. We sure appreciate you. Uh, listeners, we appreciate you uh, and your uh, feedback, please. I'm, I'm going to speak for Josh for a second here, if please. it's all right. But, uh, you know, uh, if you are curious about uh, economics, stop in to be one of those observers, maybe on the back of Josh's class, and see how, check on his slides and give him some feedback on his slides. But Absolutely. But reach out. If you have questions or concerns, reach out to Josh, uh, both for uh, curricular but extracurricular activities that you may like to be involved in and um, or, or any vision that you have that you'd like to have him validate. And what I would say, the Health Education Action Lab, we are open to any student, both economics and non-economics. One of our goals is to train students in how to do research. And so if you come in and say, hey, I'm a freshman and I don't have, have taken these upper level classes, fantastic. We have a spot for you. Let's get you involved. If they could tell, give us a, a, a location, a time general issue. And if they could drop, drop by. So I would say stop, stop by my office. So oh, business uh, 206, uh, shoot me an email, japrice at su.edu. Uh, but we do meet uh, on uh, Wednesdays, 1130 in the investment lab. Uh, but get, shoot me an email. We want to find the best way to get you involved. But everyone's welcomed. Uh, we want people involved in research. Fantastic. Josh, thanks again. And listeners, thanks again. We'll see you next month with another uh, speaker here, or no, speaker or teacher at uh, Southern Utah University. And we're tickled to have you as a part of our audience. Make it a good one. Ciao, ciao.